All right. Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to share a little bit about my, my research and, and some just general ideas on, and thoughts about collections. So my title, What Can You Learn from a Preserved Shark?, could actually be expanded to any other animal or plant or any organism, really. And what I want to talk about today, and using examples both from sharks and from other other fishes that I've worked on, um, is really the purpose and, and um, the the power of learning a little bit more about biodiversity from preserved specimens. And so. For instance, we have this, this specimen of a, of a fine-toothed sand tiger shark. This sand tiger shark is a, it's one of three species in this genus Odontaspis. And around um, the coast of Virginia, we, we often see sand tiger sharks. But this is another species that is very poorly understood, very um, unknown relatively. And looking around, there's only about four or five in uh, preserved specimens in museums and collections throughout the country. Um, this specimen actually came to us at BIMS um, through a cooperation um, and partnership with uh, colleagues at NOAA, NOAA Fisheries, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And John Galbraith, um, pictured here, he, uh, is the lead biologist on a uh, more than 50 year time series. Every year they sample, NOAA samples the fish stocks off the coast of North America. And John runs that program. And when this fish came up in that, in that um, survey, um, the survey's intent is to look at, at stocks and population levels of, of various species of fishes to help um, understand and, and, and manage those fisheries um, scientifically. When this fish came up, it didn't look quite um, like other sand tigers to, to uh, John, and he saved the specimen brought it back to their lab and in talking to um, here pictured in the back, uh, Dr. Willie Bemis at Cornell University, who is a, a researcher, um, an expert on, on this uh, group of sharks. John uh, talked to him about it and identified it as a fine toothed sand tiger shark. This was only the fifth or so uh, specimen in those 50 years that this species has been uh, reported. Um, so it's a very rare species. And one part of that being rare is that it is a relatively deep water species. And so Dr. Bemis, Willie um, and myself, and together with Dr. Gavin Naylor at the University of Florida are, are working on various projects on this group of fishes, this group of sharks that includes not only the sand tiger sharks, but also uh, salmon sharks, thresher sharks, as well as the great white shark. And we're looking at their, their um, evolutionary history, their relationships and, and various aspects of their, their anatomy. And so this rare specimen was a very uh, important part of that study. Um, and so as we do in, in, in some scientific circles, we made a party <laughs> at some level of, of dissecting this fish, inviting not only myself, Dr. Bemis and Dr. Naylor together, but other researchers, other um, uh, shark experts, um, Dr. Jack Music, who was a retired um, VIMS professor, who started our own uh, shark specific uh, survey here at, at Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is now actually the longest running, continuously running shark survey anywhere in the world. And again, these surveys are very important for understanding the, the, the population trends of those species, as well as Dr. Jose Castro, 
a researcher um, also with NOAA, but in, in the southeastern portion of, of the country based in Florida, Dr. Castro has actually written the book on North American sharks. Um, he knows more about the, the shark biology of, of North American sharks than pretty much anybody else uh, around. So for three or four days, we dissected this specimen. We under, got to understand aspects of its anatomy, aspects of its ecology um, by looking at that, that specimen closely. For instance, if we look at the teeth on this shark, one of the most dramatic factors of, of, of shark biology is are the teeth. Everyone is, is fascinated by shark teeth. And here, this, these long slender cusps followed by, you know, surrounded by these short, tiny uh, cusps, they look striking and they look very much like the tines of a fork, right? So we have here the, the upper jaw and the lower jaw here. And those by coming together, much like tines of two forks coming together, will be, um, will grab onto a prey item and um, pull that prey item apart into uh, bite-sized uh, mouthfuls. So, Right, just by looking at these these specimens, we can start to learn and understand a little bit about the biology of the uh, sharks. So, we understand a little bit about how they might feed, how the that that um, this species will take bites out of out of a shark, and we can start to compare that morphology, that shape and form of the tooth, to other taxa other species such as this tiger shark. This is a, a set of shark jaws that I collected oh, almost 20 years ago. And we, um, and you can see instantly that there's very different shaped teeth to uh, a shark, uh, to this tiger shark. And here is just one tooth blown up. This is actually a CT scan of, of one of these teeth and you can see a very serrated edge, much like a bread knife type uh, edge and recurved this curved edge with a little point. And then this, this uh, followed by another series of these serrations. So you can start to uh, think about how this shark might feed. And this is something that um, Dr. Bemis, uh, you know, kind of clued me into when he shared me, shared with me a picture of this. This is a can opener. This is an old school, old style can opener. Here is the blade that might, that you use to cut through the, the lid of a, a aluminum can. So with very different from the, the tines of a fork, right? We see these different morphologies, different shapes of, of teeth that lead to different uh, feeding styles. And that follows through. In the gut contents of this shark that I collected are these bones. These were in the stomach of this tiger shark. The tiger shark, these bones are actually the ribs and portions of the shell of a large sea turtle. So one of the, the prey items that a sea, uh, tiger shark uh, feeds on specifically are sea turtles. And you wouldn't do very well on the shell of a, a sea turtle with two forks, but with a can opener, you're much more able to cut through that shell, to cut through that, that prey item and feed very effectively. So just by looking at these specimens, we can start to infer, start to think about differences in ecologies, differences in things like how they, they function in their, their environment. But we can also extend that to understanding how these fishes might be related. So here are six uh, cross sections. So if we took the lower jaw and split it in half and looked at the inside of that 
uh, those uh, jaws, we can see these um, these uh, uh, teeth, these tooth rows. Oh, sorry, I I jumped ahead there. Um, we can see the functional tooth, and then these replacement teeth going earlier and earlier in development. And these are, are various species of the sand tiger, of the mako sharks, um, the salmon sharks, and the white sharks, um, the, white, the great white shark itself. And you can see in different perspectives, different morphology of teeth within this relatively closely related group of fishes. But you can see also details of how those teeth develop, develop with these little tusks, these little cusps on the side. These are, are, um, are various, uh, these various structures form differently. Differently, for instance, between the white shark that has them, they are always part and connected to this main cusp versus these accessory cusps on the salmon sharks and the, the sand tiger. So that tells us that these structures are different in, from a developmental perspective and might mean something differently, different in terms of, uh, of how they, these fishes are related. And this all goes into, these observations all go into this uh, into the body of knowledge that we have on these these uh, groups of fishes, and we're expanding this into a study of how the the white sharks, sand tigers, threshers, and that whole group of sharks are related to one another. Um, this is a group again that that includes such dramatic fish as the um, as the uh, thresher sharks that have this really greatly elongated. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> jumping ahead again. Uh, oh, these long uh, tail fins that they use to stun prey. Um, the goblin sharks, a deep, deep water form that with another very distinctive uh, group of fishes or group of teeth, as well as the the white sharks and, and various other species. But now we can compare that anatomy to also the, um, the genetics. So here are complete uh, sequences. These are analyses related or based on uh, DNA sequences from the, what is called the mitogenome, uh, uh, the mitochondrial DNA of, of these fishes. The entire portion of that sequence, some 17,000 base pairs of the of, uh, genetic data we can analyze that, and we find that um, in based on those data, these thresher sharks, the three species of thresher sharks, aren't each other's most closely closest relatives. So they're they're more akin to cousins rather than than brothers and sisters, and and that is shown here in this this. Uh, um, we call it a cladogram, but it, you can think of it as a family tree. That is in, in contrast to our um, anatomy, our, our morphology, and what we can analyze with that. The monophyletic or, or single origin of the thresher sharks is, re, is found in the anatomical data. This is a, a, a study that is still really in its infancy and we're, we're expanding both the genetic information that we're, we're looking at as well as the anatomical characters to better get a better idea of how these are related, how they are, um, are um, uh, basically how they have evolved um, within the group and how they are related to other sharks generally. And all of this is made possible by natural history museums. So natural history museums, if you, if you think of, of that as a concept, you might come up in your mind with, with uh, buildings such as this. This is the natural history museum in uh, London, the, the British Museum of Natural History. Um, and a very stately, very um, 
amazing building that they um, that is uh, you know one of the world renowned uh, um, natural history collections, and you know rightfully so they've been doing it for a long time. This is one of the specimens in that collection. This is a, a an Atlantic sturgeon, and this is one of the specimens that Linnaeus, um, who who came, developed um, the the modern approach of, of taxonomy, developed it in the 1700s. But this is one of his specimens from the 1700s of that uh, European Atlantic sturgeon. Now Linnaeus was a botanist, so he had every all of his fishes pressed onto to herbarium sheets or or these big plant uh, pres preservation sheets of paper. Um, so, but you can still tell even after a, a, you know close to to three hundred years, you know you can count different structures on this the specimen of a sturgeon. You can identify it as such. The, the Natural History Museum in London also preserves um, specimens from you know, Captain Cook's voyages around the world. So this is a, a surgeon fish um, collected um, during uh, Captain Cook's second voyage in the late 1700s, prior to the, when the United States was even a, a country, before we had declared independence. Captain Cook collected this uh, fish in the South Pacific. And we can go back to that specimen. We can now, with uh, digital uh, radiography, we can look at its skeleton. I asked uh, the collections manager there to send me a, uh, an x-ray of this fish, um, James McLean, and he was able to, to take a, an x-ray and send it to me without me even leaving Gloucester Point, Virginia. Um, so we were able to, to see the internal structures, the skeleton of this fish. Not only that, we get to see its last meal. So we can see all of these uh, uh, pieces of, of these hard-shelled invertebrates that this uh, surgeon fish was eating um, 300 years ago. So collections come in all shapes and sizes. Natural History Museum is one of the largest in the world in London. Ours is the largest in Virginia. The Nunnally Ichthyology Collection at VIMS is, is the state repository for fish specimens um, in the state of Virginia. And at this point, I'd like to virtually introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Huber, who's the collections associate in, and collections manager in charge of looking and keeping track of all of the specimens that we maintain here at BIMS. And the mission statement that we, we uh, operate under, I think nicely kind of outlays why we do this. Here highlighted in red, the collection supports the mission of VIMS of research, education, and advisory service by engaging a broad community of basic and applied research scientists worldwide, providing the foundation for graduate education and research and inspiring the public by sharing the biodiversity of fishes and the research that is being done to gain a better understanding of the natural world. That is what, that's why I'm here, is to share with you what we do at the, the Nunnally Ichthyology Collection and how this, uh, is is shaping our research on on the biodiversity and the fish diversity not only of Virginia but worldwide. So what do we have? We have about forty two thousand lots of alcohol preserved fishes. So these are fishes that have been preserved in formalin. So formalin is a really nice strong fixative. It keeps the a, a specimen from decaying and that will that's great these specimens if properly cared for will be here long after that 300 400 years of um of preservation but it's not nice to work with so we transfer that into a into alcohol an ethanol solution that is much easier and much safer to work with as as researchers 
and preserve them in these jars. 42,000 lots, a lot is considered any one species collected at one point in time at a particular place. So if I went out to a stream and collected 10 minnows, each that those 10 minnows would be a lot. If I went back the next day and collected 10 more, that would be another lot. So a lot can be one specimen, as in these specimens, or hundreds in, in the case. So this 42,000 jars or lots translates into roughly half a million individual fish specimens. Coupled to that, we also uh, look at, at the skeleton. The skeleton of fishes is an amazing architectural uh, uh, apparatus. There are well over 100 bones and cartilages just in the skull of a, of a typical fish. And each one of those carries information about its evolutionary history, about its ecology, about its, its um, uh, just how it functions in the, in the environment. And so we have about 500 or a little over 500 specimens, um, most prepared by uh, beetles. So this is an Atlanta, uh, a Pacific uh, wolf fish, a, a, a fish that I'm studying or a group of fishes that I'm studying now. Um, this is uh, in our beetle colony. In our beetle colony, you can see some of them here. The beetles will actually clean the, the skeleton uh, free from tissue, and you end up with a very clean uh, specimen that can be examined for all of those 100 plus bones in the skull. For smaller specimens, the beetles would do too good of a job. They would eat right through it. So we clear and stain them. So this is a, a, a clear-nosed skate. A, a skate species that we have around here in, in Virginia, um, and one that, that I'm uh, working with a student, Lindsay Nelson, um, on their anatomy. Um, and here we, we see this uh, skate that has been cleared. So it's been uh, soaked through a series of, of uh, chemicals that, that break down a little bit and clear out the, the, the soft tissue all of the, the muscle and skin is still there, but it's been rendered transparent, as well as um, the cartilages here uh, stained in blue, and then any calcium. So sharks and rays and skates are unique in having a uh, calcium layer on top of their, their cartilage. It's not bone, but it's a, it's a calcified cartilage. And that calcium will stain red here just like a bone in a bony fish would stain red. And we can see this, the, the structure of all of the, the fin rays and the fin supports of this ray, of the skull, of the jaws, and other interesting elements within the, the animal. This fish is only about four inches long. So we were able to see the fine details of how that the skeleton develops, how it's structured, how it works together um, in a whole animal. So we have about 800 specimens of cleared and stained uh, fishes. And then we also have tissues. So I mentioned genetic um, data. That's undeniably important and it complements what we can do with the, the specimen, um, the whole preserved specimen. And we have taken um, before we fix uh, a specimen in formalin, which binds the, that DNA together, so it's, it's harder to unlock, we take a little fin clip and preserve that in alcohol and uh, use it to, uh, as an archive to um, match back to that whole fixed specimen. We can analyze the genetics in years to come. For, so we've had about 3,100 um, individuals, uh, individual tissue samples. So basically, um, so the emphasis, each collection around the world has its strong points. And our, our strong points are, are in, in four main realms. 
fishes of the Chesapeake Bay and Mid-Atlantic. We are the only collection that is continuing to collect and archive and maintain that database of fishes of the Chesapeake Bay. Fishes are, are it, within Virginia, we're really lucky. You know, the Chesapeake Bay is this really dynamic and really interesting fish fauna. About 300 species use the bay at any one point or at, at some point during the year. However, only about uh, 30 of those species are year round residents. And that reflects this really dynamic and really um, incredibly fluctuating uh, environment that the Chesapeake Bay represents. So in the summer, uh, as, as it is now, it's really warm. That, that water is really tropical in, in its, in its um, behavior, in its, in its physical uh, um, properties. Come December, February, those, that water is going to drop precipitously. So we can reach near zero degrees, near freezing uh, temperatures in the Chesapeake Bay. And the fishes respond to that, migrating in and out of the bay, different species using the bay at different points in time. That's changing. So we're starting to see new species, different species um, coming from more southerly waters um, off the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina. Those fishes are, are starting to be year-round residents in the bay. We also maintain a large collection of deep sea fishes. So deep sea fishes are, are really an untapped, an unknown, unexplored um, part of our biodiversity. So th things like hatchet fishes and, and dragon fishes and fang teeth fishes, as well as this uh, gulper eel. These, these are fishes that very few people see alive. You can, you can, um, the technology and the, the videography from NOAA and, and other agencies is becoming much better such that we can see these animals in their natural habitat. But most of what we know about these, these species, what they eat, how they eat, what they are, do in their environment comes from the research specimens. And our collection of deep sea fishes, with an emphasis from the North Atlantic, is actually one of the largest collections in the country. I said we are also, a, a, you know, we're kind of blessed with good fish fauna here in Virginia. Uh, we are seeing um, these, not only do we have great uh, marine fishes, but we also have large, uh, a large number of freshwater fishes, particularly in the western part of the state, in the Blue Ridge and Appalachian provinces of, of Virginia, we get these dramatic uh, uh, stream fishes. So this is a candy darter, a recently dis, uh, uh, listed federally endangered species found only in a few streams in western Virginia and West Virginia. And um, our collection of freshwater fishes from Virginia is actually one of the, the uh, a very important collection representing over 50 years of annual collections to some spots that allow us to go back and look at the health and the, the community of these streams in Western Virginia. We also have a large uh, collection of about 50,000 vials of larval fishes. So larval fishes can look very different than um, than uh, adult forms, um, particularly in marine fishes. So up here, this is probably the best example. This is a, a, a sunfish, an ocean ocean sunfish, um, related to mola mola, and you can see that these are, you know, basically little balls of spikes. This scale bar here is 0.2, 20 tenth or uh, 0.2 millimeters long. So this specimen is no more than about uh, one and a half millimeters long. This will grow into a fish that is about half a meter long and looks nothing like that fish. 
we can we have a large collection of these larval fishes from projects undertaken by VIMS researchers all over the world, North Atlantic, North Pacific, Antarctica, um, all all over the the planet at this point, and about fifty thousand vials of these specimens. So. We have all these fish. We have a great collection, well used throughout the world. Why do we have it? You know, and, and I've talked a little bit about what we can do with these specimens, but why have a fish collection? One, one of those reasons is to preserve that biodiversity of Virginia. So we know we can't preserve what we don't know. And there are new species being described in that, in that biodiversity of Virginia, um, undescribed species being identified all the time. We voucher the research being conducted at VIMS. One of the hallmarks of science is repeatability. And vouchering these specimens allows us to, to repeat observations, to go back and check what people looked at 50 years ago, 100 years ago. These specimens preserve that, that those observations and allow new researchers to come in and challenge or confirm those those um, those observations. We're in a changing environment. There's uh, you know range expansions due to, to natural climate change to, that that is out there. Um, the, the Chesapeake Bay is warming, and that like I said. Those specimens, that, you know, from North or those species from North America or North, sorry, North Carolina, have expanded into the Chesapeake Bay. We also species become invasive, so we we see uh, species being trans uh, transported around and establishing new populations. And these these specimens preserve that as a uh, as a physical evidence of those in invasions. We also serve a broader scientific community. We, we operate as a library that people can, can borrow our fishes from. And then we also preserve these fishes to provide education and outreach and, and connect people to the, the, this little component of biodiversity. So some of that research is, is obviously conducted um, here at, the, at VIMS, which is the School of Marine Science for College of William and Mary, is done by students. So here's a, a, one example of student research that um, this is a, a student of mine that uh, Allison Deary, this was one of the papers that she worked on for her, her dissertation work. Um, looking at the jaws and the feeding structures of these uh, larval and, and juvenile uh, drums, the, the drums, the croakers and spot and, and so forth um, in the Chesapeake Bay, and looking at, at what point in ontogeny, what point in development do these fishes change, going from some species of drums are good open water predators like our, our spotted sea trout and, and that group of, 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 of drums, whereas others like black drum and red drum are much more benthic, much more bottom-oriented uh, species. And at, at early, early stages of development, they look virtually the same. But then during development, they, their morphology here with some of these cleared and stained specimens, she could see when that morphology diverges into um, the, into what, what will serve either an open water predator or a benthic predator the best. And this type of research is becoming much more important because it becomes a predictive thing. And now Allison is actually in charge of the uh, larval fish survey program for the uh, for the Gulf of Alaska Fishery Science Center for NOAA, and she's operating and, and organizing and running that survey, and collecting more specimens, looking at these ecological uh, correlations. 
we also support undergraduate research. So this is a, a, spe uh, a student of mine, Khalil Russell, who um, together with a, a, a former PhD student of mine, Kate Bemis, and, and a PhD student at the University of Florida, uh, um, Gabe, uh, he, they're, they're all here in, in, um, in South Florida collecting uh, cichlids. So Khalil came to me early in his, his uh, undergraduate program. He's fascinated by uh, cichlids generally. Um, he's raised cichlids as a, a hobbyist um, from, from as long back as he can remember. Here he is, uh, I took him on a, a trip to the Smithsonian to look for specimens to, for his research, um, going through their, their collections here. Just almost giddy about looking at these, these species up close. Just looking at a, a um, research project on native versus non-native uh, species. So he's um, been looking at, uh, at the anatomy and the structure of these fishes um, in non-native populations in South Florida that have been, uh, and comparing that to uh, their native ranges in Africa and South America. We you know, support global research. Here's a, an example of, our, of, of a paleontology group in Switzerland looking at fine details of, of these fossil fishes, the gut contents and the gut morphology here in this, in this Sorichthys, this lizard fish from the Cretaceous. And they can compare that morphology of that fossil taxon here to sturgeons and paddle fishes and other groups of fishes. And for instance, this gar, and this paddlefish, their, their information is based on specimens that we preserved here at the Nunnally Ichthyology Collection. We sent them specimens to dissect and to compare to their fossil species. We also voucher invasive species, particularly you know, relevant to, the, to Virginia off the coast here. We have now uh, lionfishes, um, in the rivers, blue catfish and, and snakeheads, but there are, are always new documented uh, species uh, showing up, being transported around. Um, most recently, the Game and Inland Fisheries Department has, has found uh, Alabama bass, a, a relative of, of largemouth and, and smallmouth basses, have been introduced in several parts, uh, several uh, lakes and reservoirs in Virginia. So I've touched a little bit about why and how these specimens are used, but what is a specimen? Specimen starts from the fish being collected in the field, but it doesn't stop there. So there, with each of these tags, these VIMS TIS numbers represents one of those tissue samples. So that is part of this specimen. We also have all of the field notes, all of the, the conditions that, that um, were in that river here. All of these fish came from Boone County, Missouri, um, that collected by myself and, and my daughter actually, um, in last summer. So we have all of these specimens, but we have the temperature, we have the time, the date, the conditions, we have the photographs of that stream. So these, all these fish came from this, this stretch of, of a stream. All of those can be archived and presented digitally. So researchers worldwide have access to those, those specimens. And through things like the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, integrated digital bio collections, these, these aggregators, um, so-called aggregators, bring together not only our information, our data from not only ichthyology collection, but collections around the world, such that researchers then can then look at, at those um, and, and find specimens for their own research. Um, 
in the 2000s, we had use, uh, use for tissues. Um, that was an evolving technology. Now it's an evolving technology of CT scanning. So all of those specimens that we have collected from 300 years ago and on up, we can now CT scan. This is a, uh, a shad that, that I CT scanned and digitally reconstructed. And those digital reconstructions can, this is a, a frog, but, um, and it's part of a, a 17 institution uh, project that, that we are part of to, uh, to scan all vertebrate diversity. And you can, from this one specimen, you can get the nervous system, the muscle system, the, the vascular system, the ovaries, the, how many eggs, the parasite fauna. All of these, these aspects of, the, of that specimen be, can become uh, used. Here is one example of a, of a, a specimen that we uh, scanned as part of that project. This is a larval silverfish, a keystone species in the Southern Ocean. This is a, an important prey item for um, the for penguins and, and other macrofauna, but little is known about their population trends and um, or their anatomy for that instance. Or, uh, and that's the current study of one of my, my PhD students looking Andrew Corso looking at those those taxa throughout um, a, a long term time series, but. As a side project, we're looking at the anatomy of these fishes. So looking at the brain structure based on this CT scan. Again, this is about an inch long fish um, and we can get all of the muscu muscles and all of the sensory systems in this fish without causing damage to that specimen. We can get uh, these so-called natural history byproducts. The, the food items in the gut contents of this three millimeter long uh, slender sunfish larva. Um, this is a CT scan. Now we can get these. Um, this is a toadfish that one of my another of my students, Diego Vaz, uh, scanned. Looking at and here these shadows, you can count the number of eggs this fish would um, would show. And we can get other aspects of, of their natural history. So this is a, this is a study that uh, was conducted by a student that I, I uh, am collaborating with. This is Christine Parsons, who was looking at this, uh, the age and growth of these uh, butterfly rays. This is a, a group of fishes called Gymnura. Um, a couple species that are off the coast here, but they show up as bycatch. Um, in a lot of uh, trawl fisheries, but we don't know anything about how fast they grow, their ecology. And using the CT scanning technology, Christine was able to be the first to document and, and figure out how quickly they grow. Here, looking at the, the CT scans on this vertebra, this is one bone or one element out of the the backbone of this butterfly ray, she could count the age, just like you count tree rings of this uh, species. In the course of that project, she started looking at the morphology a little bit closer. And this is another species, the smooth butterfly ray that was described um, in the 1800s from specimens off the coast of Suriname. But it also extends up into North America and into the Gulf of Mexico. Recently, uh, a group from Brazil has described Gymnura micrura, uh, micrura as separate from Gymnura lessi, um, this North American species. But even within this newly described species, Christine found um, some some bizarre or, or unexpected variation. So a little bit of morphological difference between the Western North Atlantic and the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and expanding that into her life history study, 
there was distinct differences in their biology. So the northern Gulf of Mexico grew didn't grow quite as large as the the supposedly same species off the coast of the North Atlantic. They grew mo you know, very different aspects of their reproductive biology. Maximum fecundity, 12 versus 6 in the Western North Atlantic. And from that study, from those both morphological study, but also the life history study, we can now extend that to, to the um, genetics, and we very firmly find that we have three different clusters. So one from the Suriname area, the northern coast of South America, one from the Gulf of Mexico, and one from the Atlantic, such that now we can identify this Gulf of Mexico species as something very different from Lesi. So we're in the process of describing this, this new species as uh, a, a third North Atlantic uh, species of butterfly ray. So with that, what, you know, I hope I've shown what you can learn from these uh, preserved specimens. But it goes beyond that systematics and taxonomy. Understanding you know, how structures are, are created can, can be very important for engineering. Um, you know, there's been instances of people CT scanning bird nests to, to figure out how, they, um, how the, they can withstand you know, a lot of, of torsion. There's genetic studies from lampreys even that, that may uh, come into play with, with cancer research, things like that. Those come up, we don't really expect them. So this was a study that I, I conducted about 10 years ago on the larval fishes of, of uh, Chesapeake and Delaware Bays. And we just were interested in looking at how many spe uh, species were there, when they were coming, differences in sizes and understand. But that resulted in a large collection of these fishes that I was contacted recently by a student at Rutgers who is looking at um, the ear stones of larval summer flounder, looking at, at when they might have been uh, hatched and when they, they moved into the, the bays along the East Coast. And she took that little ear stone from those preserved specimens collected from a completely different uh, perspective and uh, looked at, used this process called laser ablation to look at their stable isotope analysis, to look at how and where those, uh, those fishes were born. And one of the things she found was, interestingly, all from all along the coast, from North Carolina to New Jersey, all of those taxa, all of those specimens came from a, a particular area here off the coast of North Carolina and migrated into those bays. Uh, and that has changed over the time. So this, again, based on these specimens, give us insight into real world um, important uh, aspects of understanding important resources such as summer flounder. We also, uh, you know, enjoy bringing students from from uh, from the field processing those specimens all the way through to the um, to putting those specimens on a shelf and using these as a, a good important uh, connection to stimulate the the interest of those stu students into uh, into uh, biodiversity research as well as the public. So. No, you know, you start talking and pointing to structures on specimens, and you know, people become very interested, very, uh, uh, very captivated by the biology and the the 
importance of these fishes and, and other organisms in their environment. And one of the beautiful things we, we get are, are some of these uh, thank you letters where uh, kids particularly, which is an important uh, component of the population. We want to get the next generation excited by biodiversity. And, you know, I think we've, we've done that. I'm back to liking dead stuff, which I, 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 that warms my heart. I love the jaws. I love the fish collection. Thank you. This was, um, you know, very, very important to us to, to know that we are connecting with that next generation. And we also uh, integrate into the, the, um, the community at large. So we, we have a, a volunteer program at VIMS that allows uh, members of the public to come in and, and help with the, the curation, the organization, the, the explanation of the, this important resource. So with that, I'd like to thank you for, for tuning in. And, um, you know, next time we're open for Virgin, the VIMS Marine Science Day. I hope you'll join us to, to come in and um, see, see what we have. So thank you. All right, Dr. Hilton, thanks very much for being with us today. We really appreciate, appreciate having you. Uh, and also we'd like to thank our sponsors at Bon Secours. Uh, so uh, every Wednesday at noon, you can uh, join us for Lunch Break Science. You can register online at smv.org and it is free for, the, for uh, 300 registrants. Thanks again, Dr. Hilton, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Until then, stay safe and stay curious.